The following program is sponsored by Community Psychiatric Centers and is produced for educational purposes only. It is not intended as a substitute for medical or psychological advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The content should not be used for self-diagnosis or treatment of any health-related condition. As always, seek the advice of your health care provider with any questions regarding a medical or mental health condition. Welcome to Community Psychiatric Centers Presents. Tonight, a look at childhood psychosis, a disease you don't hear a lot about, but a disease that can be very debilitating to children. What is it? Who's at risk? And what symptoms should you look for in your child? For answers, let's turn to our experts. Dr. John Carrasso is Clinical Director of Community Psychiatric Centers. He's a clinical licensed child psychologist and a certified school psychologist. And Dr. Robert Lowenstein is Medical Director of Community Psychiatric centers. He's a board certified child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist, and a fellow of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Dr. Lowenstein, what is childhood psychosis, and is it related to schizophrenia, and are children diagnosed with schizophrenia? Childhood uh, psychosis, or is a term that's used to encompass a variety of diagnostic conditions of which childhood schizophrenia is one of them. Childhood schizophrenia is a serious condition that affects children usually under the age of 12 and that can affect uh, their thinking, feeling, and produces unusual behaviors. Some of the typical symptoms that we see in childhood schizophrenia can include child experiencing delusions, often of a paranoid nature, meaning false beliefs, so often that they're being harmed by others, the presence of uh, hallucinations, which can be hearing voices or seeing people that are not there, having uh, uh, thoughts that are quite confused and uh, disorganized, uh, having um, what's called uh, inappropriate affect or blunted emotions to, con to a situation to which they don't respond appropriately. And uh, it also can include the presence of strange behaviors, usually social isolation, problems in their ability to relate to other people. Dr. Carrasso, how common is childhood psychosis and what are some of the risk factors? Good question. Fortunately and thankfully, it is a rare condition, especially in younger children. And teenagers, uh, the rates are about the same as they are for adults, about 1%. For, for younger children, it's more like 0.2%, which is, again, both quite rare, but especially for, for younger kids. The reason for the lower um, rates of diagnosis for younger children, there's probably a few reasons. One of which is <clears throat> that it's just genuinely a rare condition for younger children. It's just rather rare for uh, those types of signs and symptoms to present in kids, you know, three, four, five years of age. Also, practitioners are somewhat reluctant to diagnose such a serious condition in a young child. So they may be more likely to diagnose something like uh, a diagnosis called um, psychotic disorder NOS, which is some more benign sounding, not quite as, it doesn't have the stigma. Um, in terms of the risk factors, there tends to be a high genetic predisposition for schizophrenia. So if, if there's a family member who has schizophrenia, then there, there's an increased likelihood that some other child, uh, some other family member, such as, a, such as a child, would have it. Also, uh, there's a tendency then, if a child, especially a teenager, because uh, schizophrenia will typically present in late teenage years, but if a a uh, teenager has a genetic predisposition for schizophrenia because, again, there's some family member, maybe a parent or a grandparent who, who has been diagnosed in that regard. And then, then, and then the teenager experiences some, some significant stress, like going away to college, and that's when those signs will sur for sur first surface. Dr. Lowenstein, what are some of the misconceptions about schizophrenia? <laughs> right, yes. Um there are a lot of misconceptions about schizophrenia. First and foremost is uh, a lot of people say, is it split personality or is it uh, a multiple personality disorder? And the answer is no, those are separate conditions. Uh, a multiple personality disorder or a conversion disorder or a disassociative disorder are different conditions than uh, schizophrenia, which includes problems in the person's ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, social withdrawal, problems in the ability to think 
clearly and act appropriately, which isn't present in those conditions. Also, uh, there is a misconception that people that are schizophrenic are violent people and that they're responsible for lots of crimes of violence. And this is simply not the case. Most schizophrenics prefer to be isolated, they're withdrawn, and they're rather peaceful and passive people. Also, uh, uh, some people feel that uh, paranoia is only seen as schizophrenia, and that's not the case. Somebody can be uh, paranoid and fearful, and it appears in other conditions, uh, such as depression. Uh, somebody that has a severe psychotic depression, for example, might present with severe paranoid symptoms. Uh, people that hear voices, children hear voices, are not always psychotic, uh, especially in young children. This is not considered pathological, and the presence of voices also occurs in other conditions as well. Dr. Grosso, what's the evaluation process like at community psychiatric mm. centers? How do you uh, evaluate a child for yeah, good this? Good question. We want, to, we want to get a full interview with the parent. We want a history of what's been going on with the child, you know, from the time of birth to the present. Get a, get a strong sense of what's going on now with the child and what the current concerns are. Of course, we're going to conduct a clinical interview of the child. We want to get a sense of how they're presented. We want to assess for signs of psychosis as well as any other signs and symptoms of any other problems that could be um, appearing to be uh, signs of psychosis but may not be. Um, typically include some sort of behavioral protocols uh, to assess the rates of behavior as well as mood. There are also things referred to as projective assessments, which people have heard of ink blots and whatnot. Uh, they can be very, very helpful to help differentiate psychosis from some other condition. There's also other projective assessments as well that we might use. We want to monitor the condition over time, which is very important, given the, given the idea that, that schizophrenia won't even be diagnosed until it presents for six months. Uh, so, uh, of course, we're not going to wait for six months to provide treatment. We're going to treat very quickly, and that's really one of the keys to, to a good outcome, as well as one of the things that we want to focus on over the course of time, which is monitoring very closely how treatment's progressing and how the signs and symptoms are coming about. We also want to refer for a complete medical workup uh, to rule out any other conditions that may be masking as, as schizophrenia. There are quite a number of conditions which need to be ruled out in order uh, to not diagnose it uh, uh, incorrectly as schizophrenia. For example, a child or an adult that presents with psychotic symptoms may have a brain tumor. So it's important to do an MRI of the brain in order to rule that out. Or they may have some um, drug addiction or they may present uh, as being intoxicated or children who use drugs, inhalants, they uh, huff uh, substances, use marijuana or PCP may trigger what appears to be a psychotic episode when really it's a drug-induced type of condition. So it's very important to do these medical tests to rule out those conditions. There are toxicological tests that need to be done as well to rule out the presence of other toxicities. Sounds like this would be a challenging condition to diagnose. Is that correct? It's quite challenging uh, and uh, quite rare. Uh, sometimes schizophrenia appears very suddenly, oftentimes in an 18 to 20 year old. It's a first break of psychosis that's not been present before and it's a very uh, disorganizing experience for the whole family who's confused and uh, rather upset about seeing a child that had been normal previously now being unable to function. All right, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back with more questions for our doctors right after this. If you have a question, you could always call for a free phone consultation also. The number is 1-877-899-6500. We'll be back right after this. At Community Psychiatric Centers, the help you need is just a phone call away. Led by Dr. John Carrasso and Dr. Robert Lowenstein, Community Psychiatric Centers offer fast, thorough mental health evaluations for children, teens, and adults. And when it's time for therapy and treatment, trust CPC's professional staff of psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, and therapists to put together a plan that works. Call 1-877-899-6500 today for a free phone consultation. It sounded like a good investment, but it was a company I'd never heard of. I really didn't understand the details, but the young man who called me seemed so sincere, but he said I had to act right away. I just didn't know what to do. 
For information on avoiding investment scams, call the Pennsylvania Securities Commission. Welcome back to Community Psychiatric Centers Presents. We're talking with Dr. John Carrasso and Dr. Robert Lowenstein of Community Psychiatric Centers about childhood psychosis tonight. And Dr. Lowenstein, what are some of the common treatments for this disease? Well, the first and foremost uh, treatment for this disease is the use uh, of medication along with uh, some of the other psychotherapies, which we'll talk about later. Uh, the one medication type that's used primarily in the treatment of psychosis in schizophrenia children are the antipsychotic medications. There are two of them that have been approved by the FDA. Uh, one of them is uh, erisperdal and the other one is Abilify and they're both now approved in the use of this condition. Uh, when they're used, uh, it's very important that the family work very closely with the physician to get the right dosage of the medication and also to watch for the presence of side effects because side effects is a major problem for these types of medications uh, and um, it's important to avoid them if possible, switch to other medications if they appear, and add other medications if the side effects can be treated with those medications. So they need to be monitored very closely. Conditions also the child may bring to the table also have to be watched closely if they have heart disease or other conditions which uh, can be as, uh, exacerbated by the use of these medications. Blood glucose levels, etc., also uh, are important to be followed. Dr. Crosso, what about some of the other interventions that families might expect if they were at CPC? Sure, sure. Uh, quite a number of strategies that we would utilize, and that include something called psychoeducation, which is helping to educate the child in the family about the signs and symptoms, how to understand them, how to, how to better cope with them. We may also uh, facilitate um, wraparound services, which is where the, the practitioners, the therapists would go to the child, to the homeschool community. Especially true, especially helpful if there are behavioral problems, which there very well could be. A child who's experiencing these signs and symptoms that were, that were described by Dr. Lowenstein could be quite distressed. Distressed children not uncommonly act out behaviorally, so wraparound services can help with that. They can also help with, with a very important part of this, which is social skills. Uh, children who have issues with psychosis and schizophrenia, teenagers especially, um, they typically lack social skills and they tend to withdraw. And so the problem with that is that that just worsens the signs and symptoms. So the, the, the counseling and or the wraparound services would help with teaching the child social skills and then also getting them out in the, into the community to help them be, be more successful with that. And we also facilitate uh, connecting the child with community resources, uh, possibly a partial program which helps with educational um, resources as well. Uh, spe special education services, possibly hospitalization. If a child is really having a rough time, they may need to be hospitalized. We can have facilitate that as well. Dr. Lowenstein, when should a uh, parent seek professional advice? Well, it's very important when a parent sees their child beginning to uh, deteriorate that they seek professional advice as soon as possible. The child is functioning fairly well and they begin to display signs of withdrawal, uh, hallucinations, delusions, unusual behaviors, uh, a refusal to attend school, um, and um, the strange thoughts and feelings are present. It's very important that they seek professional help immediately. It may be due to schizophrenia or one of the other conditions that may have some of the signs of schizophrenia which also need to be ruled out and treated. So it's very important to call us in order to uh, get this evaluation done quickly. Dr. Carrasso, can autism ever be confused with um, a condition similar to childhood schizophrenia? I mean, because yeah. yes. some of the symptoms might be similar. That, that's true. And I do want to say up front, though, that there are distinct differences between autism and schizophrenia, clearly. And those and, and the potential for confusion really reflects the need for families to work with uh, experienced practitioners who have experience working with children with autism as well as schizophrenia so that those so the children are not misdiagnosed because that, that just complicates the matter further. But in terms of, of similarities, yeah, there are some. For example, a child with um, autism, not uncommonly, their, their speech can be somewhat confusing and confused to, to listen to. Sometimes they're quite socially withdrawn. Uh, sometimes they, they'll be involved in behaviors that are quite peculiar or unusual. And that could be conf confused with schizophrenia. Interestingly, we talked a few weeks ago about how uh, the rates of autism had appeared to increase 
but after further review, so to speak, there was some some consideration that well, maybe not. Maybe it was just a matter of these children being being children who had been had been misdiagnosed, possibly with schizophrenia, uh, are now being accurately diagnosed, and that makes the rates seem higher. So that's an important point. Lonstein, what's the uh, long-term outlook or prognosis for these children? Right. Well, the 10-year outlook studies that have been performed with children with schizophrenia tend to indicate that around 50% of the time, if a child is treated early and effectively, uh, they will have uh, they will not be cured of schizophrenia because it's not a curable disease, but they will have recovered and improve their condition and symptoms to the point that they function quite well. Maybe another 25% of the population who is appropriately treated will have some improvement but still need lots of support and lots of intensive treatment. Maybe another 5% uh, or, uh, or uh, another 15% are severely impaired and uh, actually don't ever improve and they need long-term care of uh, a serious and intense nature and maybe 10% are no longer with us. It's actually the rate of suicide amongst children with uh, childhood schizophrenia or adults the childhood schizophrenia raises to about 10% of the population. So it's a very serious condition when that occurs. In addition to early treatment and intervention, what uh, help improve? What else helps to improve the outcome? Well, I do want to emphasize again the importance of as soon as the symptoms appear, it's vitally important to seek assistance to help evaluation treatment. And so, again, as Dr. Lonsky mentioned earlier, if parents are seeing, especially in their teenagers who are 16, 17 years of age, noticing suddenly that they're becoming more withdrawn and peculiar and to seem disheveled and whatnot, don't wait call for a consultation we could talk about this is very very important but there are there are some things that help to improve outcome as well one would be is that uh, if there's no family no family history of the disorder that clearly helps the situation if um if the adjustment prior to the onset of symptoms was a positive adjustment, the child, the, the child or teenager was functioning well and doing well, that that suggests a, a better outcome ultimately. If the onset was sudden as opposed to slow and progressive, that may sound counterintuitive, but actually, if it's a, if it's a sudden onset, that actually reflects possibly a better outcome. The older the person is upon the onset of symptoms, the better off. Uh, and finally. Uh, Treatment-wise, we want to work with the family to help them keep emotion and emotionality as reduced as possible. We want things to be predictable, ordered, routine. We want uh, there to be a nice balance between providing this person with support and consistency, but not not promoting dependency at the same time. So we'll work with families to help to make that happen. It makes for a much better outcome. The other thing that really helps make a good outcome is compliance with treatment. <laughs> it's very difficult to get these children and adolescents to take their medications, to come for therapy, to put into practice some of the things they learn in therapy. And uh, if they're not compliant with taking medications and coming to therapy, prognosis is much worse. Another, another issue was, was the idea of denial. Denial is a career serious problems. These individuals sometimes don't recognize that they have an illness. So why take medication? Right. That could be a problem. Yes. All right. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with more questions for our doctors right after this. If you have a question and you'd like to check out their website, it's cpcwecare.com. We'll be right back right after this. have a child, adolescent, or teenager who is having trouble at home, in the community, or at school. Call Community Psychiatric Centers for help. I work as a licensed psychologist and certified school psychologist. My partner, Dr. Lowenstein, is a board-certified child psychiatrist. Together, along with our professional staff at CPC, we are prepared to meet any family mental health need when they need it most. When a child is in crisis, when a child is suffering, when a child is in pain, a family is in pain and a family suffers. And our goal is to relieve that pain and find the child where they are and help the family to heal. And that's the basis of our program, is to help families to heal. For a free phone consultation, call Community Psychiatric Centers today at 1-877-899-6500 and watch Community Psychiatric Centers Presents Wednesdays at 7.30 on PCNC. Community Psychiatric Centers, connecting you, your community, your world, one family at a time. Welcome back to 
Community Psychiatric Centers presents. We're talking with Dr. Robert Lowenstein and Dr. John Carrasso of Community Psychiatric Centers about childhood psychosis tonight. And now we're going to uh, turn to some other mental health topics in the news. Uh, Dr. Carrasso, here is a topic. It, it seems like once we think we've heard everything, no, we hear something else. And mm -hmm. uh, this was the recent court case mm -hmm. where a child with autism-like symptoms, uh, the case was linked to vaccines. Yeah, more, more uh, fuel to fire the, this debate between autism and vaccinations and whatnot. Uh, yes, it's a remarkable development. Uh, federal officials are saying that a particular child is entitled to compensation from a, a federal vaccination fund. Didn't know one existed, but apparently there is one. Uh, because this child developed autistic-like symptoms when uh, after vaccination, I think in the year 2000. Uh, what they're saying is that it, it aggravated an underlying condition that already existed. Apparently this child has some issues with mitochondria and the vaccination worsened that condition so that the, the neurological situation for the child worsened and then they began to develop again autistic like symptoms now according to the CTC the uh, CDC is saying that this is not to be generalized to quote unquote normal children that this is a condition that was a rather rare circumstance uh, and that parents should not be afraid to have their child vaccinated however you know how that goes uh, when something like this happens parents raise even more questions and, and justifiably so doesn't sound like we've heard the last no, of it. Certainly, oh. certainly not. Dr. Lowenstein, two-pronged approach helps adolescents who don't respond to initial antidepressant alone. Right. There have been several studies that have been published. Uh, there was one that was published in the Journal of American uh, Medical Association uh, in February, which uh, basically addresses the fact that about 40% of children and adolescents who were treated with antidepressants for a depression don't respond initially to the first antidepressant that they're given. And the study uh, basically um, uh, proves that uh, that the trial of giving a second antidepressant along with the psychotherapy and other types of therapy like cognitive behavioral therapies helps the outcome of that child greatly meaning switching to another antidepressant is not as good as switching to another antidepressant and also adding a psychotherapy to the treatment regimen which is something that we've known for a while but it certainly confirms that that's the best treatment approach there have been other studies that have been uh, published by the NIH which also confirmed through a, a multi-center study that children definitely need treatment with a, a combination approach. All right, Dr. Carrasso, TV and sleep and yes. children. Yes, yes. It, How it, do they it, all go it's, it's very tempting for parents to use TV for any number of things. Uh, babysitting their child, uh, helping to lull their child to sleep, mm -hmm. both tend to be counterproductive. Uh, there's uh, research out of uh, University of Washington, actually pretty extensive. They uh, surveyed families of 2,000 children and found a pretty clear connection between the amount of TV watching going on even during the day, not just not just before bedtime, but even during the day, and, and the related sleep problems at nighttime. Now, the reasons for this, there's multiple reasons. One is uh, TV is stimulating by its very nature. If it was boring, it wouldn't be on TV. And so that just before bedtime can cause problems, obviously. The idea that light from from TV screens, computer screens, and whatnot is disruptive to sleep. It, it doesn't help matters, uh, especially from TV and, and computer screens. Light in general is disruptive to sleep. Uh, TV during the day, well, the child's watching TV, they're not running around being active. So again, these things uh, get in the way of sleep. Now, the idea then, of course, is to get the TV off as much as possible. Anything over two hours is proving to be destructive according to this research. There are some things, though, that parents can do to help to induce sleep in their children at nighttime. One would be, of course, to, to establish a regular routine. There are some things uh, um, that we're showing on, on, the, on, the, on the screen. We want a quiet environment before bedtime. We want low lighting, low activity, no sodas with caffeine, that's for sure. And uh, we want a comfortable temperature and things of that nature. That's what helps to induce sleep in children, get that TV off. We know how caffeine yes. can affect us we, as, even yes. as adults. And because we don't turn this show off. Yeah, <laughs> right, of course right. not. <laughs> although, yeah, although this might put you to sleep. <laughs> That's true, too. Uh, yeah, also, no. also, the place where you go to sleep is very important, uh, meaning a child should not be allowed to go to sleep in the living room where there are other people present. and mm -hmm. They need their own quiet space. All right, we're going to take a short break. Do stay with us. <laughs> we'll be right back right after this.
Have you noticed something different about your child lately? Does your child seem withdrawn, unhappy, depressed, or prone to sudden outbursts? Your child may be suffering from a mood disorder, and it may be time to get help. At Community Psychiatric Centers, Dr. Robert Lowenstein and Dr. John Carrasso lead a highly trained professional staff that offers mental health diagnosis, treatment, and therapy to children and adolescents. Call 1-877-899-6500 today for a free phone consultation. From where I was sitting as a U.S. Army soldier, I knew I had to go where I was told, when I was told. From where my family was sitting, they knew I had to go too. I also knew that while most soldiers physically come home from war, some never return emotionally. The challenges of healing and the visible wounds of war can be a daily struggle. But help is available through the National Veterans Foundation Lifeline, dedicated to helping veterans and their families find solutions. Time may not heal all wounds, but from where I'm sitting today, I know the National Veterans Foundation can help. Welcome back to Community Psychiatric Centers Presents, and now a few final questions for our doctors from some of your emails. Uh, let's start with this one. My nine-year-old child has quite a fantasy life, and sometimes I worry it goes too far. He'll talk to himself alone in his room, and he says he has imaginary friends. He seems a bit more withdrawn lately, and his grades are dropping. Do you think he is developing some type of schizophrenia? Well, clearly, uh, he's developing something. I mean, a child that develops all of these symptoms uh, with uh, his poor ability to function at home and at school is a clear sign that something is happening. Whether or not it's schizophrenia is hard to tell, and that child would need to be evaluated in order to really tell exactly what the diagnosis is. And so the parents' concern about this is well noted. Yeah, and again, commended as well in terms of reaching out for, for assistance, as opposed to thinking, well, it'll be okay, he'll grow out of it, uh, you know, we'll just let this go for now. The idea of reaching out to, to professionals and asking for, even in an email, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's, that's what needs mm -hmm. to be done, because we don't want this to continue. Uh, an assessment would be valuable here. All right, here's another question. Uh, does time out work for mm -hmm. a toddler? Uh, the answer is yes and no. Uh, it depends upon how long and where. Uh, toddlers may have a poor sense of time, meaning if you put a toddler in a timeout for five minutes, they may not be able to stay there five minutes because mm -hmm. their sense of time is really short. So that one of the things to consider is the age before you employ some kind of disciplinary action. First thing to consider. Uh, other things to consider are whether or not uh, it's really affecting change in the child. All right. Thanks so much for being with us and thank you for watching. We will see you again next week on Community Psychiatric Centers Presents. Good night.